Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 239. Today's big Bible question is, how should we treat our enemies and political opponents? Well, hello, friends. Happy Saturday to you. In the States right now, we've got fires on the West Coast, double hurricanes about to hit the Southeast, and coronavirus basically lurking all around. But God is on his throne in his temple, and Jesus is beside him praying for his followers. Now, by opening this way, talking about what's going on in the States, I do want to acknowledge and shout out all of our international listeners, and we've got quite a few of you all out there. Thank you guys for listening, and you ladies for listening, and welcome aboard to the bloke or blokeette from Queensland, Australia, maybe Brisbane, who downloaded like 100 episodes of the show literally yesterday. Shout out also to Toby Flitchett of Queensland 2, who did something really cool. You might remember the massive floods in Australia last year. Well, Toby took a lot of the debris left over from the floods and made sort of an awesome work of art slash sculpture kind of memorial thing out of it. So good on you, mate. That's good job, Toby. Way to, um, way to make lemonade out of lemons, I guess. Well, today's Bible readings include 1 Samuel 14, Psalms chapter 30, Jeremiah 51, and Romans 12, which is our focus passage. So let me ask you a series of pointed questions and really think about this. Do you have any enemies? Now, maybe not a personal arch enemy that's, you know, always trying to kill you or whatever, but a person or group of people who are opposed to you somehow or you're opposed to them. Maybe they're so different ideologically from you that you're convinced they are hurting you or your group or your country or your city or whatever. Now, almost all of us have ideological enemies. Do you hate Democrats? Do you hate liberals? Or do you hate Republicans? Do you hate conservatives? Do you hate Trump supporters? Do you hate enemies of Trump? Do you hate your sports rival? Do you hate fans of your sports rival? Do you hate your boss? Do you hate the person who looks down on you on social media? Do you hate a mean, annoying, harsh, or critical relative? Do you hate your ex? Do you hate any one person or a certain group of people? Because if you do, or if you're even close, maybe you're saying, well, I don't hate them, but I certainly dislike them. Well, not a lot of difference, biblical speaking. So if you got some people you hate or dislike, to say it in a nicer way, then today's podcast is for you. In a year where unprecedented has basically become a cliche that you hear all the time, I have observed an unprecedented amount of hate, dislike, come from those who claim to be Christians. Now, usually that hate is in the political realm, but sometimes you see it in other scenarios as well. And very often, the justification that a Christian might give for that hate is either something like, A, well, you got to fight fire with fire, or B, this particular group or person is bad, they're advocating bad things, they're leading our country, city, group, whatever, in a bad direction, and our anger is justified. They must be stopped no matter what the cost. Except, as we will find out today from Paul and Jesus and As we have already heard many times in the Bible up to this point, Christians can't be that way. Full stop. No exceptions, no excuses. Followers of Jesus have a very specific ethos as to how we are to treat our enemies. Our personal enemies, our ideological enemies, our political enemies, etc. We've got some very clear commands in this regard. Not a lot of wiggle room, friends. And this is incredibly important. Now listen to how Jesus explains it in Matthew 5, verse 43. He says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Oh, that's pretty challenging. Jesus is calling us to a much higher life of love than those who don't follow him. Remember, they're going to know we are Christians by our love, says John 13, 35. And people of the world, you know, they hate their enemies. They do bad things to them. Not so with Jesus' followers. Instead, we bless those who curse us. We love those who are our enemies and love those who we dislike, and we pray for them. 
Now, not in a snarky, holier-than-thou way either, in an obvious, kind, genuine, and authentic way. As Jesus said, almost everybody loves people who love them. Terrorists do that. Criminals do that. Swindlers do that. Auburn fans do that. And others. Well, I'm just kidding about the Auburn fan thing. Roll Tide. But totally kidding. Best friends are Auburn fans. Let's read Romans 12 and see how we are to behave towards our opponents and our enemies, including Bama fan podcasters. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Let everyone submit to the governing authority, since there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Well, do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger, that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So I want to reiterate this. So please forgive me if I'm putting too fine a point on it, but I perceive that many, many Christians in 2020 have just basically chosen to outright abandon the love your enemies and do good to them teachings of the Bible, especially in the realm of politics. Now, brothers and sisters, these passages apply to your political enemies and opponents too. Now, you might be thinking, well, how will they know how wrong they are or how evil they are if I don't attack them viciously in all of my posts? How will they change their political ways and begin to behave like me? Well, I got a couple of things to say about that. Number one, browbeating, insulting, and attacking people almost never leads to change, ever. In fact, hear me on this. It solidifies their view that they are right more and more. You want to convince a political or ideological opponent that they are right? Blast them as hard as you can, as angry as you can. You'll come across like an angry idiot, and they'll be thankful they aren't like you, hardening them in their belief. Number two, it's not God's anger that leads to repentance. It's God's kindness that leads people to repentance. So says Romans chapter 2, verse 4. So our anger... Our blasting, our insults, our sword rattling on social media and stuff, nah, it's not going to do it. So I hear your protests already. I sense some of your anger flowing through my microphone right at my face. Well, maybe that's just because it's incredibly hot in my office and I can't have my fan on while I'm recording. But I think I sense some of your anger. And you're saying, liberals or Trump supporters or Republicans or Democrats... They're not worthy of my love, you might be thinking. Well, here's the thing, friends. You and I aren't worthy of God's love either. That's grace. It's the foundation of Christianity. We don't change the world with our anger, our attacks, our snark, or our rage, but with the good news of Jesus. We don't overcome evil with evil, says Paul. We overcome evil with good. Now let that sink in, brothers and sisters. You do not overcome evil with evil. I don't overcome evil with evil. You don't fight fire with fire. Hear this, that is a worldly ethic, and maybe it works in some instances. If, you know, when you're saying maybe it works is it'll lead you to victory somehow, some way. But in the kingdom of God, in terms of changing hearts and pleasing the Lord, you don't fight fire 
with fire. You overcome evil with good. So says Paul right there in Romans 12, 21. Don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Now, this doesn't mean that evil won't be punished, so don't worry about that. You and I aren't God's agents of justice and vengeance. That's not our calling. It's not our job. Quote, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, verse 19. So let's you and I focus on our job, which is loving our enemies and doing good to them. Let's rejoice that God is on his job. Vengeance is his. And let's get out there and overcome evil with good. Not keep trying to overcome evil by attacking it in post after post on social media. So let's go to 1 Samuel 14, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. That same day, Saul's son, Jonathan, said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. However, he did not tell his father. Saul was staying under the pomegranate tree in Migron on the outskirts of Gibeah. The troops with him numbered about 600. Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, was also there. He was the son of Ahitub, the brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. But the troops did not know that Jonathan had left. There were sharp columns of rocks on both sides of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine garrison. One was named Bozes and the other Sinna. One stood to the north in front of Michmash and the other to the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And his armor bearer responded, do what is in your heart. Go ahead. I'm completely with you. All right, Jonathan replied. We'll cross over to the men and then let them see us. If they say, wait until we reach you, then we'll stay right where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up, then we'll go up because the Lord has handed them over to us. That will be our sign. They let themselves be seen by the Philistine garrison. And the Philistine said, look, the Philistine, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've been hiding. The men of Gareth the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come on up and we'll teach you a lesson, they said. Follow me, Jonathan told his armor bearer, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him. Jonathan cut them down and his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men in a half acre field. Terror spread through the Philistines and the open fields to all the troops. Even the garrisons and the raiding parties were terrified. The earth shook and terror spread from God. When Saul's watchmen in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, they saw the panicked troops everywhere scattering in every direction. So Saul said to the troops with him, call the roll and determine who has left us. They called the roll and saw that Jonathan and his armor bearer were gone. Saul told Ahijah, bring the ark of God for it was with the Israelites at the time. While Saul spoke to the priest, the panic in the Philistine camp increased in intensity. So Saul said to the priest, stop what you're doing. Saul and all the troops with him assembled and marched to the battle, and there the Philistines were, fighting against each other in great confusion. There were Hebrews from the area who had gone earlier into the camp to join the Philistines, but even they joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelite men who had been hiding in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, They also joined Saul and Jonathan in the battle, so the Lord saved Israel that day. The battle extended beyond Beth-Avon, and the men of Israel were worn out that day, for Saul had placed the troops under an oath. The man who eats food before evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, is cursed, so none of the troops tasted any food. Everyone went into the forest, and there was honey on the ground. When the troops entered the forest, they saw the flow of honey, but none of them ate any of it because they feared the oath. However, Jonathan had not heard his father make the troops swear the oath, and he reached out with the end of the staff he was carrying and dipped it into the honeycomb. When he ate the honey, he had renewed energy. Then one of the troops said, Your father made the troops solemnly swear the man who eats food today is cursed and the troops are exhausted. Jonathan replied, My father has brought trouble to the land. Just look at how I have renewed energy because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the troops had eaten freely today from the plunder they took from their enemies. Then the slaughter of the Philistines would have been much greater. The Israelites struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash all the way to Ajalon. Since the Israelites were completely exhausted, they rushed to the plunder, took sheep, cattle, goats, and calves, slaughtered them to the ground, and ate meat with the blood still in it. Some reported to Saul, Look, the troops are sinning against the Lord by eating meat with the blood still in it. Saul said, You have been unfaithful. Roll a large stone over here at once. He then said, Go among the troops and say to them, 
Let each man bring me his ox or his sheep. Do the slaughtering here, and then you can eat. Don't sin against the Lord by eating meat with the blood in it. So every one of the troops brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord, and it was the first time he had built an altar to the Lord. Saul said, let's go down after the Philistines tonight and plunder them until morning. Don't even let one remain. Do whatever you want, the troops replied. But the priest said, let's approach God here. So Saul inquired of God, should I go after the Philistines? Will you hand them over to Israel? But God did not answer him that day. Saul said, all you leaders of the troops come here. Let's investigate how this sin has occurred today. As surely as the Lord lives who saves Israel, even if it's because of my son Jonathan, he must die. Not one of the troops answered him. So he said to all Israel, you will be on one side and I and my son Jonathan will be on the other side. And the troops replied, do whatever you want. So Saul said to the Lord, God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant today? If if the unrighteousness is in me or in my son Jonathan, Lord God of Israel, give Urim. But if the fault is in your people, Israel, give Thummim. Jonathan and Saul were selected, and the troops were cleared of the charge. Then Saul said, Cast a lot between me and my son Jonathan, and Jonathan was selected. Saul commanded him, Tell me what you did. Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of the staff I was carrying. I am ready to die. Saul declared to him, May God punish me and do so severely if you do not die, Jonathan. But the people said to Saul, Must Jonathan die? He accomplished such a great deliverance for Israel. No, as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he worked with God's help today. So the people redeemed Jonathan, and he did not die. Then Saul gave up the pursuit of the Philistines, and the Philistines returned to their own territory. When Saul assumed the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies in every direction, against Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he caused havoc. He fought bravely, defeated the Amalekites, and rescued Israel from those who plundered them. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malchashua. The names of his daughters were Merab, his firstborn, and Michal, the younger. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaz. The name of the commander of his army was Abner, son of Saul's uncle Ner. Saul's father was Kish. Abner's father was Ner, son of Ablil. The conflict with the Philistines was fierce all of Saul's days, so whenever Saul noticed any strong or valiant man, he enlisted him. Jeremiah 51 verse 1. This is what the Lord says, I am about to rouse the spirit of a destroyer against Babylon and against the population of leb I will send strangers to Babylon who will scatter her and strip her land bare, for they will come against her from every side in the day of disaster. Don't let the archer string his bow. Don't let him put on his armor. Don't spare her young men completely destroy her entire army. Those who were slain will fall in the land of the Chaldeans, those who are pierced through in her streets. For Israel and Judah are not left widowed by their God, the Lord of armies, though their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Leave Babylon. Save your lives, each of you. Don't perish because of her guilt, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will pay her what she deserves. Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand, making the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations go mad. Suddenly Babylon fell and was shattered. Wail for her. Get balm for her wound. Perhaps she can be healed. We tried to heal Babylon, but she could not be healed. Abandon her. Let each of us go to his own land, for her judgment extends to the sky and reaches as far as the clouds. The Lord has brought about our vindication. Come, let's tell in Zion what the Lord our God has accomplished. Sharpen the arrows. Fill the quivers. The Lord has roused the spirit of the kings of the Medes, because his plan is aimed at Babylon to destroy her. For it is the Lord's vengeance, vengeance for his temple. Raise up a signal flag against the walls of Babylon. Fortify the watch post. Set the watchmen in place. Prepare the ambush, for the Lord has both planned and accomplished what he has threatened against those who live in Babylon. Yet you who reside by abundant water, rich in treasuries, your end has come, your life thread is cut. The Lord of armies has sworn by himself, I will fill you up with men as with locusts, and they will sing the victory song over you. He made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, and spread out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens are tumultuous, and he causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings the wind from his storehouses. Everyone is stupid and ignorant. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his carved image. For his cast images are a lie. There's no breath in them. They are worthless, a work to be mocked. 
At the time of their punishment, they will be destroyed. Jacob's portion is not like these, because he is the one who formed all things. Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of armies is his name. You are my war club, my weapons of war. With you I will smash nations. With you I will bring kingdoms to ruin. With you I will smash the horse and its rider. With you I will smash the chariot and its rider. With you I will smash man and woman. With you I will smash the old man and the youth. And with you I will smash the young man and the young woman. With you I will smash the shepherd and his flock. With you I will smash the farmer and his ox team. With you I will smash governors and officials. Before your very eyes I will repay repay Babylon and all the residents of Chaldea for all their evil they have done in Zion. This is the Lord's declaration. Look, I am against you, devastating mountain. This is the Lord's declaration. You devastate the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down into the cliffs, and turn you into charred mountain. No one will be able to retrieve a cornerstone or a foundation stone from you because you will become desolate forever. This is the Lord's declaration. Raise a signal flag in the land. Blow a ram's horn among the nations. Set apart the nations against her. Summon kingdoms against her. Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz. Appoint a marshal against her. Bring up horses like a swarm of locusts. Set apart the nations for battle against her. The kings of Medea, her governors and all her officials, and all the lands they rule. The earth quakes and trembles because the Lord's intentions, intentions against Babylon stand to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitant. Babylon's warriors have stopped fighting. They sit in strongholds. Their mind is exhausted. They've become like women. Babylon's homes have been set ablaze. Her gate bars are shattered. Messenger races to meet messenger and herald to meet herald to announce the king of Babylon that his city has been captured from end to end. The fords have been seized. The marshes set on fire and the fighting men are terrified. For this is what the Lord of Armies, the God of Israel, says. Daughter Babylon is like a threshing floor. At the time it is trampled, in just a little while her harvest time will come. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has set me aside like an empty dish. He has swallowed me like a sea monster. He filled his belly with my delicacies. He has vomited me out. Let the violence done to me and my family be done to Babylon, says the inhabitant of Zion. Let my blood be on the inhabitants of Chaldea, says Jerusalem. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I am about to champion your cause and take vengeance on your behalf. I will dry up her sea and make her fountain run dry. Babylon will become a heap of rubble, a jackal's den, a desolation and an object of scorn without inhabitant. They will roar like young lions, they will growl like lion cubs. While they are flushed with heat, I will serve them a feast and I will make them drunk so that they celebrate. Then they will fall asleep forever and never wake up. This is the Lord's declaration. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams together with male goats. How Shishak has been captured, the praise of the whole earth seized. What a horror Babylon has become among the nations. The sea has risen over Babylon. She is covered with its tumultuous waves. Her cities have become a desolation, an arid desert, a land where no one lives, where no human being even passes through. I will punish Bel in Babylon. I will make him vomit what he swallowed. The nations will no longer stream to him. Even Babylon's wall will fall. Come out from among her, my people. Save your lives, each of you, from the Lord's burning anger. May you not become cowardly and fearful when the report is proclaimed in the land, for the report will come one year and then another the next year. There will be violence in the land with ruler against ruler. Therefore, look, the days are coming when I will punish Babylon's carved images. Her entire land will suffer shame, and all her slain will lie fallen within her. Heaven and earth and everything in them will shout for joy over Babylon, because the destroyers from the north will come against her. This is the Lord's declaration. Babylon must fall because of the slain of Israel, even as the slain of the whole earth fell because of Babylon. You who have escaped the sword, go now and stand. Do not stand still. Remember the Lord from far away. And let Jerusalem come to your mind. We are ashamed because we have heard insults. Humiliation covers our faces because foreigners have entered the holy places of the Lord's temple. Therefore, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will punish her carved images and the wounded will groan throughout her land. Even if Babylon should ascend to the heavens and fortify her tall fortresses, destroyers will come against her from me. This is the Lord's declaration, the sound of a cry from Babylon, the sound of terrible destruction from the land of the Chaldeans, for the Lord is going to devastate Babylon. He will silence her mighty voice. 
Their waves roar like a huge torrent. The tumult of their voice resounds, for a destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon. Her warriors will be captured, their bows shattered, for the Lord is a God of retribution. He will certainly repay. I will make her princes and sages drunk along with her governors, officials, and warriors. Then they will fall asleep forever and never wake up. This is the Lord's de- the king's declaration. The Lord of armies is his name. This is what the Lord of armies says. Babylon's thick walls will be totally demolished and her high gates set ablaze. The people will have labored for nothing. The nations will weary themselves only to feed the fire. This is what the prophet Jeremiah commanded Sariah, son of Neriah, son of Mah- Mashiah, the quartermaster, when he went to Babylon with King Zedekiah of Judah in the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign. Jeremiah wrote on one scroll about all the disaster that would come to Babylon. All these words were written against Babylon. Jeremiah told Sariah, when you get to Babylon, see that you read all these words aloud. Say, Lord, you have threatened to cut off this place so that no one will live in it, people or animals. Indeed, it will remain desolate forever. When you have finished reading this scroll, Tie a stone to it and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates River. Then say, in the same way, Babylon will sink and never rise again because of the disaster I am bringing on her. They will grow weary. The words of Jeremiah end here. But not the book of Jeremiah. That doesn't end until tomorrow. Psalm chapter 30, verse 1. I will exalt you, Lord, because you've lifted me up and have not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You spared me from among those going down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. When I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. When you hid your face, I was terrified. Lord, I called to you. I sought favor from my Lord. What gain is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? Lord, listen and be gracious to me. Lord, be my helper. You turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Amen. Dear friends, may the Lord bless you and give you a wonderful weekend. Good day and Godspeed.